we are not addressing the food supply. We're not addressing environmental exposures that cause cancer, only the chemotherapy to treat it. And there are these giant blind spots in modern medicine that we don't talk about that we need to be talking about. Welcome back to the Kevin Roberts Show. You know, I'm starting to feel a little old because this episode includes a guest who's here for the second time, which means that I've been doing this show for a while now. So thanks for sticking with it. Thanks for subscribing. You know the deal. If you haven't subscribed, you must. Um, although I guess I shouldn't put it that way because we right now live under an American regime that's flirting with communism. And you know that communism is bad. We'll talk about that another time. This time, as we like to do on this show, we're going to mix things up. Definitely talking about public policy, definitely talking about living the American good life, but we're talking with one of America's foremost medical experts, Dr. Marty McCary. You know him as a professor at the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, but I will tell you the most important thing I know about Marty McCary is he's an all-around great guy. <laughs> That's true. Thanks for being here. Great to be with you, Kevin. I wore my boots for you. Yeah, and here I am one day, you know, not in my boots, because every <laughs> once in a while, my back gives me issues, and my back doctor, as you would appreciate, says when that happens, Roberts, just don't wear your boots. I recommend surgery. Yeah, that, I'm, 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 I'm post-surgery. Yeah, yeah. But you may not recommend medicine. That's what we're going to talk about in this book, right? Yeah. Medicine, or at least um, some medication. Look, you have been, uh, as long as I have been aware of you for several years and have gotten to know you well the last few years, which I'm really grateful for, not just a leading voice uh, and a leading expert on medicine and on some limitations of the medical field. And you're always very... Uh, constructive in how you pass along that that criticism of your own field, but you're cheerful about it. You always map that back to what we ought to be doing individually, or as is the case in your new book, Blind Spots, when medicine gets it wrong and what it means for our health, what we need to do to scale good thinking about medicine. Tell us about the motivation for the book. <laughs> Well, in medicine, we have good people. Every single nurse and PT and health professional that I know is an amazing person. They came to the profession out of a sense of compassion. They want to help people in need. It's an, it's an incredible community. But we've done a terrible thing to health professionals. We've put them on a war path to stomp out disease at the very end of the, of the uh, journey of health. And they're playing whack-a-mole as the underlying causes go unaddressed. And we're watching this explosion of childhood obesity now. Half of our nation's kids can't run a few blocks. They're obese or overweight. 40% uh, of children will have a mental health diagnosis. We've put doctors on this billing treadmill short visits. We didn't, haven't given them the time and resources to actually ask the big questions. I'm a cancer surgeon and in the world of pancreatic cancer where uh, my specialty is, we have the best pancreas cancer team in the country. We do more pancreatic cancer care than any group in the, in the country. But never at any point does anyone stop to ask, why is pancreatic cancer doubled in the last two decades? We are not addressing the food supply. We're not addressing environmental exposures that cause cancer, only the chemotherapy to treat it. And there are these giant blind spots in modern medicine that we don't talk about that we need to be talking about. Maybe we need to treat more diabetes with cooking classes than just throwing insulin at people. Maybe we need to treat more high blood pressure by talking about sleep quality and stress instead of just throwing antihypertensives at people. We've got to address school lunch programs, not just putting every six-year-old on Ozempic that has obesity, which is what the medical establishment right now is telling us. We have the most medicated generation in human history. We're going down a terrible path. Pharma is not going to be the one to correct that path. And so there's an awakening now in medicine to finally talk about the blind spots, the big issues that we are not talking about that we need to talk about. So if I were to summarize that in layman's terms, and a layman who spends some time in public policy and who loves this country as you do, and most Americans, of course, do, I'd put it this way. So, so, so grade me. It's that in the United States, we have many blessings, our freedom, but also a lot of material blessings. Even our most impoverished Americans 
have a relatively good life. I'm not suggesting they want to stay there, obviously, but a relatively good life compared to other people around the world, even though we want them, of course, to to aspire to be uh, better off materially, that when you put those things together along with the, the cutting-edge uh, research and education that has been available to us now, I would argue, for centuries, including in science and medicine, that's actually converged in the last 25 years to have some pretty deleterious effects. Unintentionally, obviously. Yeah. Um, as long as we're going to be on this, medicate everything like a reflex culture in medicine. And it starts early. It starts in medical school. You're basically, we take these highly creative, bright, altruistic young people, and we beat them with this culture. We almost turn them into robots where they just have a reflex Diagnose, treat, diagnose, treat. We basically force them to memorize hundreds of different medications and have an eagle's eye to recognize the indications. And so you come out without really uh, appreciating the appropriateness of care and the underlying things in society that are causing these chronic diseases. Where's the discussion of nutrition? We spend almost zero time talking about the role of food and toxins. Seed oils now are one-fifth of the calories that people consume. It appears as if they cause general body inflammation and precipitate some chronic diseases, can cause um, some of the problems in society, but we don't study them. The NIH is sort of on this, find the chemistry so there's a pathway we can block with a drug and then disseminate that information as broadly as possible. We got a little peek of it during COVID, but this is part of a broader culture in medicine that we need to correct. The H in NIH stands for health. Doesn't stand for drugs. Doesn't stand for your old fashioned silos. Um, people get a little taste of this when they get sick. It's like, who's in charge, right? You got all these specialists, but who's in charge? So there is an exciting movement now to say, We've got to start taking care of the patient, and that means spending time with them, giving doctors resources to study the food supply and toxins and the environment and seed oils and all kinds of things that may affect our health, not just play whack-a-mole on the back end. You say early in the book, which I, as I told you, when you arrived at Heritage a little while ago, I, I skimmed over lunch today, and I will absolutely read, and I have already told my family members about it. We're very excited to read it uh, for reasons you've already outlined. But you, you say at the end of your preface, our course correction begins with the real story on health, the real story on health, separating dogma from evidence. That means asking good questions. Questioning assumptions should not be viewed as a threat. It's the very way we find truth. If there's a theme on this show across all of the guests, from physicians, medical professionals like you, to elected officials, to fellow policy scholars at Heritage, et cetera, it's that, that we live at a time in the United States when we need to be questioning assumptions, not for the sake of you know being Socrates and irritating people, but for the <laughs> sake of getting to the truth. Why? Because the truth is so elusive, it seems, in every corner of society. And what you're saying is, in, in this book and in your comment just now, that in what is often the most important corner of society, which is our own health and our treatment of such, that we are, we're finding truth to be elusive. This is the question for you, based on, on your comment about the course correction. It sounds like the course correction doesn't just need to be in public policy, where we spend a lot of time in D.C. talking about sort of high-scale or, or, or broad-scale public policy, but also in the medical professional uh, profession itself. How do you teach humility in the medical profession? How do you teach apologizing when we get things wrong? Saying, I don't know when that's the right answer, and it was during COVID many times. People are hungry for honesty right now. Mistrust in the medical profession is way down. 60% of the public in a recent study that just got published do not have a high degree of, of trust in the medical profession. Now, some would say that's because the medical elites have been lying to the public for three or four years. Some would say it goes much deeper. They were lying to the public with the food pyramid from the government and so much medical dogma. But um, if we can be honest about what is based on a, a recommendation based on opinion and what 
is really based on a lot of great science, then people will start to trust us better. But right now, what you have are opinions that are just based on a gut feeling of a small group of medical oligarchs put out with such absolutism when the reality is there's not good science to support it. So people are smart. They've started to see through it right now. And I do think we need to ask questions. You had basically no debate over some of the biggest health questions during COVID and prior to COVID on the food pyramid, on preventing peanut allergies, hormone therapy, uh, the role of antibiotics. I mean, you go name it, uh, that topic in medicine, and we've basically had a small group of people making all the decisions. Now, you may know Jay Bhattacharya, one of my friends who's outspoken during COVID. We called for schools to be reopened sooner than they were, uh, natural immunity, not masking cl toddlers, so many of the issues that people uh, struggled with. You had basically no debate. Now, Jay is organizing a conference at Stanford University to evaluate some of the biggest public health interventions in human history that we just had during COVID. Peter Hotez and a bunch of guys out there are saying Stanford should shut down this conference. And so here you have a modern era of censorship that is challenging the basic tenet of science, which is you have to be able to challenge deeply held assumptions in the field. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of medical dogma. And as you, you touched on a couple of times already, for a lot of Americans, that door was open for the first time in a significant way during COVID. And, and there are still, as, as you just suggested, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about COVID, but even more so the public policy response to COVID. And there are elected officials who had at the time, as you knew and Jay knew, and, and I think I knew, making some questionable decisions who probably have a little bit of accountability coming to them because the American people haven't forgotten about what happened with the shutdowns with schools, churches, businesses, and so on. The question, though, whether it's about COVID or about some of the other topics you cover in your book, and there are a few I want to talk about specifically, what's the process for correcting that, though? Because it seems what I hear, Marty, as I travel the country and people raise these issues— as they say, Kevin, it just seems overwhelming. Like yeah. it's impossible. We will ever be able to course correct as much as we know it's the right thing to do. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know about you. I have not heard any apologies from any of our medical establishments. Not a single one. Not a single one. I mean, did they get every single thing correct? I mean, th this is where it's going to hurt our ability to take care of patients at the hospital. It's going to hurt my practice because people are more suspicious. And some communities in America have a right to be suspicious. If you look at the Tuskegee experiment and the arrogance, the paternalism in medicine, everyday rank and file doctors are good people. But in the group think of the medical establishment, the oligarchs who make the decisions, you see this incredible theme of paternalism, separating babies at birth in the 1950s and 60s, and, and normal babies for seven to 10 days routinely. Why? Because we as doctors had to poke and prod and you know put the kid under a French fry light and wrap them up and keep them in a nursery. I remember my little sister was born in, in the 1980s, and we asked, uh, Mom and Dad, when is the our little sister going to come home from the hospital. She was normal. There was nothing wrong with her. Well, the doctors haven't released her yet. Like, what? We wouldn't allow women to have home pregnancy tests. Women can't handle that information. That's what the medical establishment fought for. We wouldn't allow HIV patients to get the results on their own. They can't handle that information. They have to come in for an appointment. And so you, this, you see this theme of medical paternalism that came out during COVID, right? People can't hunt, understand a nuanced message on natural immunity or boosters in a young 12-year-old uh, healthy population. So we have to um, just ignore basic science in order to address a very stupid population. <laughs> and so I don't talk about COVID much in the book because I think people are sick of it and it's very, become, become very tribal. But here is a big question. You talk about the importance of asking questions. Here's a big question. Could it be that many of our modern day health crises have been created by or hastened by the hubris of the medical establishment 
ignoring the addictive properties of opioids, saying they were not addictive with such absolutism, igniting the modern-day opioid crisis, saying uh, kids should avoid peanut butter in the first couple years of life, thinking it would prevent peanut allergies. No, it ignited the modern-day peanut allergy epidemic, denying women hormone replacement therapy. Um, the food pyramid, uh, demonizing natural fats. We just had an NIH study come out within the last year saying that Lucky Charms is healthier than a steak. I mean, these are food industry-sponsored junk science that is creating dogma. And so we like to blame in the medical establishment the public for being non-compliant, for not doing the right thing. But could it be that we've been giving people the wrong information? And the hard part about chronic disease management is not telling people what to do, it's helping them do it. And we're not doing that with our 10-minute visits, billing and coding as a profession. We've got to start over. We've got to redesign healthcare altogether. You know, it, there are so many parallels between healthcare and education. Yes. And although I know you're fully capable, I won't swerve you into the, this other lane of education policy, but the, the particular parallel that I'm thinking about is with all of the best of intentions, I mean, let's let's just posit that in, in both cases. Although I don't think everyone in both professions deserves that, we're gonna we're gonna be gentlemen and do that mm -hmm. today. Most of them do, I will say. Uh, what has happened is that we have outdated systems, but with a populace that is not stupid, and a populace that, unfortunately, now for the health of the republic, whether someone's a liberal or a conservative or something in between, doesn't trust institutions. The only way that an institution can regain trust is to tell the truth, and when people in that profession make a mistake, to own up to it. And I have found, and you know this, you've traveled the world, the most forgiving people in the history of the world are Americans. It doesn't matter their ethnic background. It's part of the American story of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps. And so I always encourage elected officials, friends, you know, when you when you say something dumb or you, you make a mistake, own up to it and say, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get it right the next time. Yeah. All of that to say, Americans would completely come to retrust the medical profession if they said, yeah, we probably got the COVID stuff wrong. We, we didn't intend to, um, but we got it wrong. We're going to learn the next time. We're, we're going to be a lot less hubristic when it comes to the, the practices that we're, we implement. But ultimately, it's also going to take a – it'll have to be a reset <laughs> of how we go about this entirely. The thing that kills me about COVID is here you have – an epidemic that killed maybe 20 million people worldwide that was almost certainly avoidable had a bunch of scientists not been messing with a bat coronavirus in a lab. And yet no remorse. And in fact, the advocates for that gain of function research are still pushing that it should be done out there. Uh, Boston University took an influenza virus a couple years into COVID after the gain of function controversy. Remember, Obama banned dangerous gain of function research and the oligarchs worked around that moratorium. So when Boston University announced they had juiced up a influenza virus and you know it had infected with more lethality and contagiousness in a laboratory in a controlled setting, they published this. And the NIH uh, oligarchs called over and they said, we'd like more information on what you're doing. Can you tell us? And they were like, Screw you. We, we don't, we're, this is not an NIH grant. We don't have to tell you anything. And as long as we allow, allow these people to function like mad scientists out there, we're still at risk uh, of these pandemics. So, yes, we need humility. As you know, I, I st uh, still see patients and I'm very busy at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I made a mistake once on a patient. It was a, I would say, a non consequential mistake. I, ordered a CAT scan. I think it got done on the wrong person. I don't know if I said the wrong name or the clerk put it in or entered it wrong, but for whatever reason, a patient who didn't particularly have a good experience to start with now got a CAT scan they didn't need. And so when I found out, I went to the patient and I said, look, I've, I just found out about this. You got a scan. Honestly, you didn't need it. It was a mistake. I didn't try to sugarcoat it. I said, I'm sorry. And I haven't looked at the results yet, but I'll go run down now and look at it and share those with you if you'd like. That guy didn't get angry at me. Mm -hmm. He smiled. He said, thank you, doctor, yeah. for being honest with me. People are hungry for honesty. And the American public can be extremely forgiving if you're honest with them. 
That's a really important lesson, not just about the specific topic that engages us today in this conversation, but I think across the board in life. And, and right now, I would argue, you know, as we sit here in the middle of this campaign season, when most Americans, actually regardless of their politics, whomever they're planning to, to, to vote for, are saying, we just want to have real conversations about the things that really matter. That might be a, a, a bit of a, of a good segue into a seemingly political topic, but I don't mean it that way. Yeah. It's really a social and cultural one. And that is recently, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. dropped out of the race uh, after having captivated a, a large chunk of the American center, including some uh, center-right friends of mine. And, and understandably, I get it. I mean, I disagree with him on some things, but I really respect his focus on what he calls making America healthy again. Yeah. And it seems as if though you're not making an endorsement, nor am I, of, of any candidate, that's not what we do, that the timing of that is not only good for your book, but more importantly, as you would argue, first and foremost, it's really timely for the conversation we need to have in this country about how we have this reset in our whole health industry. Yeah, this is what I'm passionate about, right? We have underlying problems in society that no one is talking about. We've got uh, big ag and a food industry, a government-corrupted food pyramid, bad recommendations, a medical establishment that's paid off, regulators that have been captured by big pharma. And it's as if everyday doctors are supposed to just put your head down and just bill and code and diagnose and medicate, and op in our case as a surgeon, operate. And so we've got this crazy system where, you know, I remember um, – meeting with my administrator where they would say, eh, you know, you've done about 25 operations this month. Your target is 30. And you're like, what is this? You know, they're dangling bigger bonus payment at the end of the year if I hit some of the targets. They're literally revenue unit targets. We have something called work units in medicine. And, an, you know, a big operation might be 25 work units. A small operation might be five Clinic visit might be one, and they track your your work units. This isn't building trust in the audience. This party. is insane, <laughs> right? It's insane. It and is. This is a system that we we didn't design. We inherited this broken system, and nowhere is there the room or time or energy or resources to say what are we doing. We're watching these chronic diseases explode. If you look at our report card as a medical profession. We cost twice as much, our health care costs twice as much as any other developed country. And we have maybe the worst health outcomes in the world. The sickest child in the world is an American child. 20% have prediabetes or diabetes. 40% of a mental health diagnosis. We're seeing liver deposition of fat called steatohepatosis or fatty liver in up to 30% of American kids. It predisposes kids to insulin resistance, all sorts of chronic diseases, and even cancer. We're watching cancer rates go up in young people, a doubling with certain types of cancer. We're not doing well. And at the same time, no one is taking a look at the underlying causes. So I'm excited that there's a renewed enthusiasm to finally address the biggest issue, in my opinion, facing everyday Americans, and that is we are funding the most expensive business in the United States, healthcare. It became about four years ago the largest industry in America, just in terms of dollars. And what are we getting for it? Just take cancer, for example. We spend $300 billion on cancer research a year. We had a big moonshot project that was supposed to move us towards a cure. Cancer rates are up. Okay, The top presentation at our big ASCO meeting, our big cancer meeting, I mean, this is like a 25,000 doctors go to this meeting. The biggest cancer meeting in the world. The top presentation was that a cancer drug that's been around for a long time, applied to another cancer, improved survival by a couple months with no increase in the cure rate. That's our top discovery in the field uh, with a $300 billion annual investment. The ROI is broken. Any business person would say, we've got to reassess. We've got unnecessary uh, procedures. Our research team did a survey of doctors. One in five things in healthcare is unnecessary, according to doctors. It's not my opinion. That's what they answered on the report. Any industry where one in five services are, is unnecessary, 
Uh, and they'll tell you why. They'll tell you the reasons why. Consumerist culture, this treadmill we're put on, these RVU unit targets. I mean, the whole system. And so we're seeing a revolution now saying, especially young people, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I'm a medical student. I don't want to have anything to do with your lifestyle, the way you practice medicine. I want to get at the root causes. I want to study things no one's talking about. I want to be a part of a small business that's going to partner with an employer on their health benefits and partner with people around their pregnancy, around their diabetes, their thyroid problems, get into food and understand what's going on. So it's an exciting time, but we cannot keep going down this path. Pretty soon, every child in America will be on an average of four medications if we continue on this path. The average adult is already on seven medications among the half of the population that's on meds, and the average senior is on 11 medications. So we can keep medicating our population to death, or we can finally start talking about the root causes, and that's the excitement that's been generated recently around this call. And it looks like the, that, that trend toward a, a focus on the root causes and that trend being evidenced by private employers, uh, organizations like Heritage, reimagining not the health benefits, but the, like the delivery of those benefits yes. and who's doing the delivery and how accessible those medical professionals are, that that's a trend whose growth is really accelerating. I mean, I, I see that everywhere that I travel, happen to know it in, in my own family and with colleagues here at Heritage. Hang on that a little bit for us. Tell us a little bit more about that and perhaps some advice for people in the audience who are agreeing with you and saying, you know, what can I do to be part of this? Yeah. So first of all, we can fix health insurance. We can flood the healthcare sector with all the money in the world. But if we continue to put out bad information and have central planning as the way we issue health recommendations, we're going to continue to struggle. We're going to continue to squander and waste a tremendous amount of money. Medicare is already broke. And government funding for health care is running on fumes. Private employer funding, how over 100 million people get their health insurance through their employer, that is running on fumes right now. It's the reason why we're less competitive you know, when these jobs move overseas. It's because of oftentimes the cost of health care. Uh, GM spends more money on health care than they do on steel. Starbucks spends more on health care than they do on coffee beans. And so it's affecting every area of society. And a lot of people are getting rich in healthcare. We've created tens of thousands of millionaires on the backs of everyday American workers through the paycheck deduction for their health insurance, through the Medicare excise tax. And it is a burden that is growing every year. And nobody seems to be asking, what are we doing about the explosion of all these diseases and cancers and autism and autoimmune diseases? So I think there's a lot that we're starting to – where we're, uh, a lot of areas we're starting to see movement. Uh, a company called Vizana, I just met with them. They're partnering with employer groups, and there's a lot of these groups out there, uh, to walk with their employees who are going through menopause. Now, menopause has been blown off in medical schools because – an NIH scientist 22 years ago announced to the media in a press conference here in Washington, D.C., that replacing the body's natural estrogen with estrogen at the time of menopause causes breast cancer. Based on a study he did not disclose, when it was published later, there was no statistically significant increase in breast cancer. He misrepresented the data, but the media ran with it, and to this day, 80% of doctors still believe that. There's probably no medication in the modern world, arguably with the exception of antibiotics, that has improved the health of a population more than hormone replacement in postmenopausal women when it started within 10 years of menopause. They live three and a half years longer on average with one estimate. The risk of heart attacks is cut in half. That's the number one cause of death in men and women the rate of cognitive decline goes down by 50 to 60% instead of these billion-dollar Alzheimer's drugs that barely work and have high risks. The rate of Alzheimer's was reduced by 35% in one study with hormone replacement therapy. And if a woman falls or is in a car accident, they're far less likely to need surgery or break a bone because their bones are stronger. And yet, to this day, we have bad information on the medical dogma 
basically from a couple doctors from the medical establishment at the NIH who put out this misinformation, actually misrepresenting their own data. So we've got to get the word out on health. We're starting to do that. We've got groups like that group I mentioned and others now, enlightened. It used to be that the government or the establishment could say, all right, we're going to control what everyone thinks. We're going to get in our journal this statement published. We're going to get the media to say this, you know, the three corporate networks. And we're going to get the White House to make an announcement, you know, food pyramid, COVID boosters for healthy six-year-old girls, you name it. They used to be able to sort of act, lock arms, and walk in synchrony. But now there's other forms of communication. You've got your podcast. You've got lots of doctors out there. Pete Atia, Mark Hyman, Zubin Damania, Vinay Prasad. I could name a ton of them. And they're actually providing a different point of view from the medical oligarchs in the establishment. And they're freaking out. They were doing it during COVID. Oh, my God. There's people out there spreading misinformation. And the irony was, you know, they were saying that Jay Bhattacharya and I were – and many others were spreading misinformation. I mean, respected doctors at top institutions with impeccable credentials. Who have no incentive whatsoever to spread misinformation. It, it, has nothing, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, that's right. We like the, the, the highest of disincentives. The highest. And the irony was that the greatest propagator of misinformation has been the United States government. Related to that is uh, uh, what I like to call a sidewalk-level story in your book. It is my favorite anecdote in your book. It's about your Uncle Sam. <laughs> uh, not Uncle Sam the government, but a real Uncle Sam, yeah, your Uncle, Uncle Sam, uh, in, his, in his 90s down in South Florida. And it reminded me so much of um, my own grandfather who was told the same thing, which was, you better stop eating eggs <laughs> right. because they, they give you high cholesterol. And, and you write in, in the book, that uh, your uncle Sam had a, a thirty year abstinence from eggs following this terrible advice. Miserable. And and I, I take great umbrage at this because uh, what you don't know about me and, and only a few members of the audience do is I was once a part time chicken farmer. Ah. Because I love eggs that much, mm-hmm. and I I wanted my own and you know free range and all that kind of stuff. But I am an eggs addict, hmm. and so every time I see my doctor, he said I'm going to stop telling you about the cholesterol thing because it actually just is no longer. He's, he says it's no longer true, and I and I sort of wink at him and say, was it ever true? <laughs> These are kind of the kind of conversations he's willing to have, right? Yeah. And we need more of that. But talk to us about I think what is probably the best known misinformation medically, which is eggs and cholesterol. Yeah, so a guy in the 1960s named Dr. Ansel Keys created a dogma that Eisenhower's heart attack was explained by him eating too much fat. You know, classic medical paternalism. Blame the patient for their disease, right? Um, what they failed to recognize was that it, was, it wasn't natural fat. It's the refined carbohydrates, processed flour, ultra-processed foods, perhaps other things we're learning about now, like seed oils. And so he propagated a myth that natural fats are bad for you and are the leading driver of obesity. And obesity, of course, is the umbrella problem that drives uh, diabetes and so many other problems in society. It was actually the number one modifiable risk factor of COVID death during COVID. So they got he got the entire medical bandwagon with all of its elites to believe this thing and so one of those doctors in the 1980s uh, harassed my uncle sam to stop eating eggs now this is his livelihood right he grew up in egypt this is his routine he's been retired and in retirement he missed his eggs like crazy He has a routine where he goes to the pool. There's a a bunch of little community down there and they swim and then he comes home and he struggled with this like it was some cocaine addiction. It can be. (laughs) Never having been a cocaine addict, it's got to be something on on that level. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with eggs. It's a great source of protein. The medical establishment did three giant studies to try and prove that natural fats caused heart disease. All three failed to show that association. Did they apologize? No, it's the same thing we're talking about. They demonized cholesterol, which is a separate story. Cholesterol is not even absorbed. When you eat cholesterol in your diet, it's esterified. It's bound to a side chain that's bulky. It's not absorbed. 90% of it is not absorbed. 99% of your cholesterol in your body 
is made by your body. So we've been getting, we sort of beat all these doctors in America into, you got to check their, you know, this cholesterol level, that cholesterol level, put these people on statins. Now we're learning. We've been giving people the wrong information. Refined carbohydrates drives inflammation and processed foods. And it, that it's that glycemic load. So we're trying to, trying to re-educate people. And there's a bunch of doctors doing it well now. Um, but also, um, um, so um, the American Heart Association was making so much money on these cookbooks, Huge. low cholesterol, low fat. And so um, there's a psychology to this cognitive dissonance. Um, the famous Leon Festinger, a late psychologist, described how we tend to hold on to what we hear first, even though new information may be more logical or scientific. And it's not just in medicine. It's in politics. It's in business and relationships. So we need to recognize, in the words of the founder of modern medicine, Claude Bernard, we all have our biases. We need to recognize those biases and then temporarily suspend them as we hear new information. Probably an important lesson, not just for medicine, but for policy and politics and life and friendships. It's so interesting that you home in on that, not as a lesson, not just for your own profession, but that you explicitly transferred that lesson to all of those other arenas. First of all, because I happen to agree with it, I think that's true. But secondly, the purpose for my comment is we often talk about that on this show. I mean, you, you and I have had that conversation a couple years ago on the show, but whether it's it's a politician or a business leader or someone else, it's that. And and often in my arena of public policy as a as an ideological conservative, sometimes heritage takes heat for saying, well, we can have that conversation even though there are some people quote unquote on our side who disagree it's not just that they disagree, it's that they have the same attitude as the medical elite has, which is, or have, which is, you're not even supposed to have that conversation. Right. How right. dare you? Right. Because you're not complying. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day at Heritage, and I know you're this way in your own profession, when you tell Americans that, we just want to do more of it. And yeah. so I guess that's the silver lining in all of this is we see these really uh, hopeful trends not only take root, but expand. That is, Americans are asking these questions they're not supposed to be asking. And the more they ask, there are more providers like you who are providing answers and, and really helpful advice. What I'm fishing for here, Dr. McCary, is, is some real substantive hopefulness for people who are in the audience who either through experiences they've had with their own health or, or that of their friends and family, or just observing what has been going on, especially since COVID, want to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I think there is a deep hunger right now more than ever for civil discourse, for loving your enemy, for recognizing we're just having a conversation. I could be wrong. I might, uh, I can be persuaded. And that civil discourse is what's dominated most of uh, history. Back in the you know Council of Trent, and the, they were having open public discussions about theology. I mean, can you imagine that today? Today we have. I like, cannot imagine the Council of Trent today. To answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and you know it went both ways back in the day. But big tech wants to affirm what you already believe to grab your attention to make money off of you. And as long as we're pulling people to polar extremes. We're going to miss out on a basic humanity. That is, we have more in common than we'll ever disagree about. I would bet to you that 99% of Americans agree on the issue of corruption in government. I would bet to you 99% of Americans would agree with you on the importance of basic health practices out there. These are the biggest issues facing our country. Um, and so we're told to focus on these extreme issues that polarize us and to pit us against each other. But we got to recognize those are not good forces in society. These algorithms, the echo chambers of the news media, um, we have a lot more in common. When there's a pothole in a community, it's not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's a competence issue. And I, I think there's a hunger to get back to civil discourse in America 
It's profound. And I happen to think we're going to get there and maybe we're taking some steps there. I think about the, the aforementioned example of, of Mr. Kennedy uh, dropping out of the race and, you know, in a different scenario, it would seem impossible that he would he would endorse someone like Donald Trump, and by that I mean someone who's that conservative, yeah. very different um, politically. And and maybe maybe we're getting there. It's going to take a lot of steps. I know. In addition to that, it's a related point, not just from traveling the country, but from all of these focus groups that we've done at Heritage this year. The most common thing we hear from unaffiliated voters, voters in the political center who on any given day might be with the Republican candidate on the next day, the Democrat candidate, they're really trying to figure out which way to vote. The most common thing that we heard from them has been, I just want to wake up in a normal country again. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so when the when the facilitator asks the follow-up question, well, what do you mean by that? Right. Because we're trying to find some actionable information, right? How do we talk to these folks as, as political conservatives? They say, well, we just want our elected leaders, and I think by extension our medical yes. leaders, to use common sense. Mm -hmm. And part of common sense is being authentic yeah. and being humble when mm -hmm. you get things wrong. And as, I, as we've talked about, I think Americans understand that well. Yeah. Your last chapter is particularly superb. Um, imagine, what else are we getting wrong, you ask? And, and I like the practicality of it, although um, so much of the book is practical anyway. But it's a real concise exhortation about having humility, but also I think our audience will really appreciate it when they buy the book, and you will go out and buy this book, of what they, the kinds of questions they need to be asking. Give us, yeah. give us a sort of high-level overview. <laughs> well, um, first of all, it's good to partner with a physician or a clinician of some sort that listens, that, you know, the mark of a great clinician and someone who's probably given you good advice is someone who's good at listening, who's willing to say, I don't know, who's willing to say, you know, I'm going to look into that. That's an interesting question. Um, so if, by contrast, if someone says you need to do this and the reason is because I'm the expert, <laughs> run for your life. Red flag. Red flag. Yeah, and we don't want to create cynicism towards medicine. I love being a doc, and um, docs are good people. But, they are. Um, and if you're in an emergency, do whatever they tell you to do. But it's good to ask questions. It's good to know about alternatives. And it's good to ask questions about things where we've assumed we should be doing certain things. If, if we got opioids wrong for 30 years, if we got the food pyramid wrong for 60 years, if we got peanut allergy prevention wrong for 17 years, if we got uh, the overuse of antibiotics wrong for 50 years, if we got separating moms from birth wrong for 40 years, if we got all of the hormone replacement therapy, we still have it wrong for 22 years. If we got all of these things wrong in the modern era, okay, don't assume we're now just now living in the era of enlightenment where we don't get things wrong. What are the things where we assume that we're doing the right things, but it may in fact just be medical dogma. New research is showing that when a kid has a fever, you don't need to give them Tylenol, okay? Yes, if they're uncomfortable, it can help with their the comfort, but um, the idea that you have to treat every fever with Tylenol, actually new research, including out of our own institution, Johns Hopkins, is finding that it can just prolong the illness. Maybe the fever is the body's natural way of ridding the body of that infection. We're sort of rediscovering a lot of basic principles that we've uh, known about from the Bible. The benefits of fasting, whole foods, clean meats, meditating. I mean, there's like new articles on this all the time, and it's like, yeah, we've known this from ancient times. But if we've gotten all these things wrong, are we getting fluoride in the drinking water wrong? A new study shows that it may result in a lower IQ. It may be accumulating in a certain part of the brain. It kills bacteria in the mouth, which is why it reduces cavities. But what's it doing to the microbiome, the bacteria that line the GI system? That those bact millions of different bacteria live in harmony and produce serotonin involved in mood and um, to help with digestion and train the immune system. That's important. When we give antibiotics that people don't need, we're carpet bombing their microbiome. And a study out of Mayo Clinic sh is showing that it's increasing obesity, learning disabilities, celiac, asthma, all these things that have been on the rise. Um, it was an amazing study out of the Mayo Clinic. The more antibiotics a kid took in the first few years of life, 
the greater the risk of each of those chronic conditions. Um, so we've got to ask questions, see what, ask w- whether or not something is truly necessary or not. C-sections save lives, antibiotics save lives, but they're both massively overused and they're altering the microbiome in ways we don't understand. Microplastics have an effect on the body. We don't fully appreciate it, but the immune system is concentrated around the GI lining of the body. And so when it sees a foreign substance, such as a seed oil derivative, something that does not appear in nature, or a microplastic or a toxin or heavy metal or something in the drinking water, it may be reacting, causing some inflammation of that GI lining. And people have chronic pain and they don't feel well and the inflammation affects the entire body because everything's connected. These are areas where I think it's healthy to be asking questions, examine what we're doing, and also um, make sure that you're educating yourself because sometimes when I've presented the new research that's in this book to doctors, they are shocked. And they're like, wow, I can't believe that. It's incredible. Higher rate of colon cancer among individuals born by C-section. That was just out in JAMA, JAMA Surgery, our, one of our top journals. Um, if they're blown away by the studies, maybe there's something there worth asking about for yourself. I'll ask you one final question, and the custom on this show is always uh, the final question is a forward-looking question. And so we'll pick a time horizon, let's say 10 years. So it's, it's the middle of the 2030s. And what will we have needed to accomplish in changing our attitudes toward medicine, toward the healthcare industry, toward the government's role in that, in order for you to be confident that America is back on track as it relates to Americans' health? Well, number one, I think we need to see some humility. I think we are going to see that. It may take new leaders. I think we need to see an open discourse, and I think people are hungry for it, and the market has responded with podcasts out there, that giant megaphones that reputable doctors now have educating the public on general health. Probably in 50 years, we're going to be talking about your state of inflammation. How inflamed are you? We may have better measures of inflammation. People will probably be getting a lipoprotein A and ApoB blood test instead of just the routine HDL, LDL. We're recognizing now there are better markers. So we are moving in the right direction, I think, in many areas, in pockets. And there's a bit of a revolution in medicine. But if we leave it to a small group of doctors at the top to tell everybody what they need to be doing, what they need to be saying as a doctor, and we have a sort of a censorship police out there, we'll be going backwards. But I'm optimistic, ultimately, I think there's a hunger for something bigger. I think people recognize Governments are not reliable sources of information. And um, I think people got a sneak peek of the medical establishment during COVID. Hopefully they can be educated on health and wellness through this book and other books that are out there, podcasts and people out there who are trying to speak truth. Dr. Marty McCary, thanks for the conversation. Thanks for everything that you do. And uh, most of all, thanks for being a friend. Personal land of heritage. It's always a, a real pleasure. Great to see you, Kevin. Thank you so much. You bet. So I really do mean it. You know that we, we talk to a lot of book authors on this show, and we never have the conversation without my having at least skimmed the book, which I did. And when I say you really need to go out and buy it, you do. I mean, this, this is a terrific book. Blind Spots, When Medicine Gets It Wrong and What It Means for Our Health. Enjoy the book. Follow Dr. Marty McCary. Most of all, on every aspect of American life. Keep your chin up. We're going to win. Thank you. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than 10 million supporters of the Heritage Foundation. The executive producer is Crystal Kate Bonham. Sound design by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, Tim Kennedy, and Joseph Fonspakovsky. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.